Genesis 40. Genesis 40. And look at verse number 8. Genesis 40, verse 8. And they said unto him, We have dreamed a dream, and there is no interpreter of it. And Joseph said unto them, Do not interpretations belong to God? So the title for the sermon uh, this afternoon is Interpretations Belong to God. Interpretations belong to God. One thing that I forgot to mention uh, on Wednesday when I preached through Genesis 39 is that Genesis 39, Genesis 40, and Genesis 41 are three chapters together that are excellent uh, as far as teaching leadership. What it means to be a leader, you know, we have a great example in Joseph. It reminds me very similar to Genesis 31, 32, and 33, which were three, ver- two, three chapters together that dealt a lot with conflict and conflict resolution. But if you're someone that has a desire to be a pastor or, uh, you know, you're a leader, uh, I really recommend study 39, 40, and 41. There's lots of great tips. We see how Joseph goes from being nobody to, you know, taking over a whole prison, you know, or, or, or nobody and, and taking over Potiphar's house and having, a, you know, people subjected unto him and having that great authority. And we continue learning about what it makes to be a great leader. And I want to tailor this more to the church today um, here in Genesis chapter 40. But let's, uh, let's pick it up here in verse number one, Genesis 40, verse one. And it came to pass after these things. So just a reminder, uh, Joseph was accused, falsely accused for trying to lie with Potiphar's wife, and he was then sent into prison. So he's now in prison, uh, and, he, and he has a high authority there, right? He's looking after the things there. So it came to pass after these things that the butler of the king of Egypt, that's the butler of Pharaoh, and his baker had offered their lord the king of Egypt, sorry, offended, have offended their lord the king of Egypt. And Pharaoh was wroth against two of his officers, against the chief of the butlers and against the chief of the bakers, and he put them in ward in the house of the captain of the guard into the prison, the place where Joseph was bound. Now look at verse number four. This was a memory verse. And the captain of the guard charged Joseph with them, and he served them, and they continued a season in ward. So what do you notice there about Joseph? A great man of God, a great leader. You know, he's, he's gone into prison. He's now found grace in the sight of the, of the prison keeper. He's now in charge of the whole prison. He's running the show. And then you see these two being brought into prison and they're put under the authority of Joseph. He, Joseph is charged with them to care for them. And then what it that say, say there in verse number four, and he served them. Hey, you know what the great truth of biblical leadership is? You're a servant. You're a minister, okay? And the pastor, and I know I've preached on this again, but hey, we're going chapter by chapter. The Lord sees fit to remind us of these things. If you want to be a leader in the house of God, you want to have biblical leadership, you've got to be the servant. You've got to lower yourself and you've got to put others before you. You know, Joseph has a great position here. What does he do? He serves, all right? He sees the need that they have. He takes care of them and he serves them. And again, this is what a lot of pastors need to hear. You know, the church is not about the pastor. The church is about the body of Christ. And the pastor is called to be a minister, to humble himself and to teach the Word of God. This is a a, a ministry. This is a job of ministry, studying God's Word and preaching God's Word. And look, you know, you may not be in a position of leadership, but the principle is still true for you. The principle here is still true, that you ought to look after people, especially if they're under your authority. But I'll just read to you Proverbs 11, verse 4. Proverbs 11, verse 4, it says, There is that scattereth, and yet increaseth. And there is that withholdeth more than is meat, but it tendeth to poverty. Actually, you guys can go there. Let me, let's go there. Proverbs, go to Proverbs 11. Stay in, in, in Genesis 40. Go to Proverbs 11, verse 24. Let's read it again together. Proverbs 11, verse 24. Because even if you're not a leader... You can take heed to this. You can take heed about being a servant by being a help to other people. Proverbs 11, verse 24. Let's read it one more time. There is that scattereth and yet increaseth. What's that talking about? That's somebody that has possessions, but he's not keeping it for himself. He's taking it and he's scattering it. He's sharing his possession, right? And even though he shares it, he scatters what he has, it says he yet increaseth. Okay, this is a biblical principle. If you're a child of God and you want to increase, well, learn to be someone that is generous. Learn to be someone that's ready to serve other people. Because look at the reverse, and there is that withholdeth more than is meat, and that is the temptation of some. You know, you, you, you have a lot, and you want to withhold it. You want to keep it for yourself. You don't want to give it away. You don't want to lose it, right? Withholdeth more than is meat, 
but it tendeth to poverty. See, if you're just looking out for number one, you're just looking out for your family, you don't care about anyone else, you, can, you will tend to poverty not being, you know, for not being generous, for not being a servant to other people. Let's keep going. Verse number 25. The liberal soul, what does liberal mean? Someone that's, that's uh, again, generous. Someone that's giving, right? That's liberal with what they have. The liberal soul shall be made fat. Man, that's why I'm on keto, because I was too liberal. <laughs> uh, being fat is being prosperous, being given many things, right? But he was liberal. He was willing to share. He was willing to be a blessing to other people. He shall be made fat. But look at this. And he that watereth shall be watered also himself. All right? So if you give, this is a concept of reaping what you sow. If you reap, you will sow. You do good to others, good will be done to you. And that goodness may very well just come directly by the hand of God. Look at verse number 26. He that withholdeth corn. So this is someone that has food, that has wheat. He withholds it. The people shall curse him, right? But blessing shall be upon the head of him that selleth it. So if you've got more than you need, you've got food, you know, you can even sell it. You can start a business, you know, and sell it to other people. People will appreciate that. But if you keep it to yourself, it's going to wither away. It's going to rot. And people will curse you because well, you, look, look what you've got. Why aren't you being generous? And this is a great principle in the Bible. You know, be, be generous with what you have. And I know money can be tight. I know, you know, you, you're thinking, well, we could really do this. But really, if you've got your needs met, see how you can be a blessing to other people, right? See how you can be a blessing to others. And uh, Jesus puts it this way in Matthew 23, verse 11. But he that is greatest among you shall be your servant. You want to be great in the kingdom of God? You want to do great things for God on this earth? You shall, sorry, yeah, you shall be your servant or shall be your servant. He that is greatest among you shall be your servant. And brethren, we need to learn how to be servants. You know, it's great to be served. And here's the thing. If all of us learn to be servants, you say, I'm going to come to the house of God and I'm going to serve. Yeah, well, I don't know how many of us we are. Is it 45, something like that? Well, if, if you just make yourself a servant and everyone else in the church applies this principle, you're going to have another 44 people serving you. How good is that, right? 44 people serving you. All you have to do is make yourself a servant. Everyone else in this church a servant. But what if they don't serve me? What if I'm the only one serving? Don't worry, there are blessings for that as well. We'll cover that later on. But this is biblical leadership, a servant, okay? Lowering yourself and making sure other people, even those that are under your authority, are getting what they need, all right? And as a pastor, it's my job to make sure I preach the Word of God without compromise and I give you what you need to help you in your spiritual walk. But back to Genesis 40 now. Genesis 40, verse 5. Genesis 40, verse 5, you see this, cap, this, uh, this uh, baker and this uh, butler, they now have these uh, amazing dreams, these dreams that were given to them by God. Look at verse number 5. And they dreamed a dream, both of them, each man his dream in one night, each man according to the interpretation of his dream, the butler and the baker and the king of Egypt, which were bound in the prison. And look, 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 at, look at Joseph again. He's a guy of authority. Look what he does, right? And Joseph came in unto them in the morning. So he's looking out for them, right? He's serving them and looked upon them and behold, they were sad. Now look, I don't know if you've ever been a supervisor in your job or maybe parents with your children. When you see people under your authority that are sad, how are you going to react? Ah, get over it. What are you doing? Is that what Joseph does? Verse number seven. And he asked, Pharaoh's officers that were with him in the ward of his Lord's house, saying, Wherefore look ye so sadly today? You see Joseph's heart? He cares for those that are under his authority. He sees they're upset, they're worried, they're in sorrow. He says, look, what, you know, what's up? Can I help you? You know, what's, what's the situation? You know, Joseph was able to just, you know, lower himself to the point where he can, you know, weep with those that weep. You know, he was, he was concerned for the welfare of others. And I love that about Joseph because it's not just Joseph that is like that, but our Lord God is like that. You know, when you're going through difficulties, when you're going through hardships, when you're going through sorrow, you know, the Lord will weep with you. You know, the Lord wants to comfort you. It says in Psalm 147 verse 2, The Lord doth build up Jerusalem. He gathereth together the outcasts of Israel. The outcasts, the rejects of Israel. He gathers them together. And then he says this, He healeth the broken in heart and bindeth up their wounds. You know what God wants to do in your life? He wants to heal your broken heart. He wants to bind your wounds. 
Okay? And it's great that we have a God like that. And we see that as an expression when Christ was walking this earth 2,000 years ago. You know, He came healing the brokenhearted, right? He came encouraging those that were without, those that were weak, and He was a great blessing to them. And if that's how our Lord God is, then we need to reflect that same character within ourselves, okay? Especially if you have people under your authority. You've got to tend to their care, to their, to their needs, and, uh, you know, I, I said it before, Romans 12, 15, rejoice with them that do rejoice and weep with them that weep. So it's showing empathy, right? When you see a brother in Christ, when you see somebody under your authority, or just a brother or sister, just someone in church that's suffering, then be, go, and, go and suffer with them. Go and weep with them. Go and encourage that person. And uh, back in Genesis 40, verse 8, Genesis 40, verse 8, why were they saddened? Verse number 8, and they said unto him, we have dreamed the dreams, and there is no interpreter of it. And Joseph, Joseph said unto them, Do not interpretations belong to God? And that's the title for the sermon. Do not interpretations belong to God? Yes, okay? Tell me, tell me them, I pray you. Now, when we look at this, it's telling us that God is the interpreter. What does it mean to interpret? You know, if we had somebody that couldn't speak English, let's say we had someone visiting and all they could do is speak Spanish. Well, I could be an interpreter, right? You wouldn't understand what they're saying. They wouldn't be able to communicate with you. Uh, but he could speak Spanish to me, and I could, I could translate that or, you know, interpret that into English for you. So that which was unclear can now be made clear to you. And now you can respond and speak back to that Spanish-speaking person through me. I can interpret back. That's an interpretation, right? And what it's saying here, these guys are having two dreams, and the only one that can interpret this correctly is the Lord God. That's the only one. And brethren, this is what it's like about the church, and, and this kind of goes hand in hand together with what I preached this morning. But your life needs to be interpreted. You know, the, the place you're in, the, the, the way you are, the family that you have, the sins that you're struggling with, whatever shortcomings you have, it needs to be interpreted in light of God's Word. It's God who interprets our lives, right? We have it kind of mixed up, and we use this term loosely, interpretation, We'll say, well, how do you interpret the Bible? I mean, even I use that lingo sometimes. But you know what? The Bible's not to be interpreted. You know, it, it, there's no, like, we, we, there's, there are not various interpretations of the Bible. Okay? The Bible is to be read. This is how God sees things. And then we interpret our life in light of the Bible. Interpretations belong to God. You know, I, I have brethren sometimes come up to me, and, you know, there's some, some situation, some difficulty in their life, and, you know, it's like, well, what do we do? What does, you know, what does God want for us? Well, then I need to take your life and put it, measure it next to the mirror of God's Word, and then we interpret where you are in life in light of God's Word. And if possible, you try to line, line it up more with God's Word. And of course, there are mistakes that we make that we can't necessarily go back and fix, but we try to line it up as close as possible as we can with the Word of God. Um, if, I'll just, if you guys can keep your finger there and go to uh, 2 Peter chapter 1, please. 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1. Interpretations belong to God, brethren. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 19. And I feel like this is one of our favorite passages as a church. A lot of us turn here. But 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 19, such a great passage. It says here, We have also a more sure word of prophecy, speaking that's of the word of God, Whereunto you do well to, that ye take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. What's it saying there? That the scriptures are, is what gives light to your life, to the things that you need to believe, the things that you need to do. Verse number 20, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. Listen, the scriptures are not of a private interpretation. Okay? God does not expect you to come and bring your own private interpretation to this word. And what, what it's actually saying there in context here is that the scriptures were not written by private interpretation of men. This is not man's ideas. This is not man's thought. It's not man's private interpretation. Verse 21, what is it then if it's not man's interpretation? It says, For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. You see, the Bible is God's Word. It's God that wrote this book, and therefore, we interpret our life. We interpret our beliefs. We interpret our, our, our opinions in light of God's Word. 
Okay? Too many preachers out there will bring their opinions, will bring their interpretations, and stick it into the Bible and preach it like that. No. We have to take God's Word as it is written, right? And then we interpret how we live in our lives, the things that we need to believe. And again, like we use this term loosely. You know, how do you, you know, we might disagree on a passage, for example, and we'll say, well, that's your interpretation. There's only one interpretation. It's God's interpretation, right? Now, the Bible has usually, you know, I've, I've heard, often heard it said there is one interpretation or one meaning, but multiple applications, all right? Now, that's something you need to understand. Sometimes it's hard to differentiate between those things. But again, sometimes, let's say the men, we have a Bible study on a Friday. We look at the Word of God. We look at one verse, and one might say, well, it's like this. And one might say, well, it's like that, right? And then, but here's the thing. Those are applications. You're taking the same truth, but then you're applying it to different things. And that's fine. You can take the truth of God's Word. It is very deep. It is multi-layered. And apply it to many, many things. But at the end of the day, there is only one interpretation. There is only one meaning what, 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 that's coming out of that. You're not going to have a private interpretation of your own and bring something in that's not there in the Word of God. That's why I'm very careful as a preacher. I try to preach on what is black and white. I try not to deviate too far from the Word of God because the more I deviate from the Word of God, the more likely I could preach error, preach something wrong, okay? So we need to understand there's only one interpretation, God's interpretation of life, okay, but many applications that come from the Word of God. That's why some people can preach, you know, you might listen to another preacher that preaches through Genesis 40, and he might take what I, what, what's being taught here and apply it in a different way. But here's when you know there's a, there's a private interpretation. When it's not that there are different ap applications, but rather what people are saying are contrary to one another. You know, if I take a portion of Scripture and I preach it one way, but then someone else preaches it and it's a conflict, you know, that they cannot be both true, well, that's when there's a private interpretation. That's where one is wrong or both could be wrong. Both could be wrong, okay? But generally speaking, if we have the Holy Ghost in us, we take the Word, as, uh, Bible as it is, we take it literally as much as possible, and that's the right way when you read your Bible, take it literally until it's obviously not talking about literal things, okay? When it says about the trees clapping their hands, that's not literal, okay? They don't have uh, hands, but it's talking about creation, just glorifying God uh, because of the creation that it is, and so we take things literally, then if it's clearly not literal, we'll take a you know, as an allegory or something that is spiritualized or something like that. But interpretations belong to God. Interpretations belong to God. And the Bible also says in 1 Corinthians 2.13, it says here, which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. You know, who's teaching you today? Yes, God's using Pastor Kevin right now, or we have another preacher here, let's say Sam, Brother Sam. You know, God will be using Brother Sam, but if it's coming from the Word of God, it's the Holy Spirit that's teaching you these things. The same Holy Spirit that's in me is in you, okay? The same Holy Spirit that taught me these things is the same Holy Spirit that can teach you those things as well to yourself, okay? That's why we can go back and compare these things to the Word of God. But then it says in verse 14, But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. What's the natural man? That's the old man. So those that are unsaved with the old man, without the new man, they cannot understand the, the spiritual things. But here's the thing. If you're walking after the flesh, if you're living after a carnal way, life, you're not going to understand the Scriptures as well, and you're going to find yourself in error. It's the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. So Joseph is correct. Joseph's going to, going to interpret their dreams, okay? But he says the interpretation belongs to God. So whatever he says will be coming from God directly. And as a preacher, whatever you preach must come from God directly, must come from the Word of God, okay? We're, we're given the same privilege that Joseph did, okay? He was able to interpret their dreams with the Word of God. We have the Word of God in full, the full canon, all 66 books. We had more than what Joseph had. Praise God for that, right? Now, back in Genesis 40, verse 9, Genesis 40, verse 9. And the chief butler told his dream to Joseph and said to him, In my dream, behold, a vine was before me, and the vine were three branches, and it was, uh, though it, uh, sorry, and it was as though it budded, and her blossom shot forth, and the clusters thereof brought forth ripe grapes. And Pharaoh's cup was in my hand, and I took the grapes and pressed them into Pharaoh's cup, and I gave the cup into Pharaoh's hand. So that's a pretty straightforward dream. 
he has a dream, you know, he's a, he's a, he's a butler, and he sees these ripe grapes, he takes those grapes, he squeezes them into Pharaoh's hand, fresh juice right there, fresh, fresh wine, you know, un, you know, non-alcoholic wine being drunk there by Pharaoh. That's the dream that he has, and he says, well, what's this about? Why did I dream this? And, uh, and again, these are not your, your average dreams, okay? These are not your average dreams. These are dreams that were given by God, and God would use these dreams eventually for Joseph to get out of prison and become second in charge of all of Egypt, okay, eventually. But, you know, we could say these dreams reflect our personal lives, okay? These dreams, they're not some nonsense dream. These are dreams that actually um, uh, are future events to come, you know, very shortly future events to come. So we don't have these dreams that are given by God, but we have life. Okay, and we might be at a point in our life and we don't know where the Lord is leading us. We don't know what to go, where to go. We don't know what decisions to make in life. And that's when, you know, your life needs to be interpreted by the Word of God. You need to go back to the Word of God and get clarity as to, you know, where you need to head in life. And Joseph, because of God, was able to then interpret these dreams. Look at verse number 12. Look at verse number 12. So Joseph is being used to interpret that which is unclear. Verse number 12. And Joseph said unto him, this is the interpretation of it, the three branches are three days, yet within three days shall Pharaoh lift up thine head and restore thee unto thy place, and thou shalt deliver Pharaoh's cup into his hand, and the former manner when thou wast his butler. So he says, look, in three days, you're going to get back your old job, you're going to get back your old position, this is what your dream is, and you're going to be serving Pharaoh once again. You're going to get out of prison after three days, okay? So this is good news. Good news for the butler. Now, we're going to skip verses 14 and 15 just for now. We're going to come back to it later. We're going to skip verses 14 and 15. Look at verse number 16. It says, When the chief baker saw that the interpretation was good. So was this a good interpretation? Yes, right? This would have given joy. This would have given confidence, satisfaction, to the butler, hey, I'm going back to work, I'm going to get my job back, I'll be back providing for my family, whatever it is that he needs to do, it's exciting news, it's good news, right? And this again, you know, we're taking these lessons as a leader, especially as in the church, especially if you're a preacher. You know, that there is a time to preach what is good. You know, and, and everything in the Word of God is good, don't get me wrong, but you know, there are times to just edify one another, one another. there's times to just motivate one another, it's, there's times to send the good message, right? But it's, 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 it's good when it's true. The point is, whatever you preach behind the pulpit, it's got to be true, you know, even if it's good, even if it's bad, it's got to be true. Now look, yesterday, yesterday I went to get a haircut, all right? So I went to Aura, to the, to the barber there, it was quite a bit expensive though. I'm not recommending to go there, okay? But I got talking to the guys there, and they've been to church before. They went to the City Life. I can't remember which one it is, right? And uh, so I'm talking to him about church and stuff, and he's like, yeah, it was all right, you know? But, and this is exactly what he says. He goes, it was just too happy-clappy for me. You know what I mean? Because it's a Pentecostal style, right? Too happy-clappy. He goes, like, it was good for a while, but there was a time I just, I just needed something else. It's, it's always happy, all right? It's always happy. And I said to him, well, come to our church, but just get ready to hear some controversial things. And he goes, yeah, that's where it's at, the controversy, right? So listen, you know, people want the truth. You know, the happy, clappy church will make your flesh happy for a little while. But if you're someone truly seeking the truth of God's word, you're going to want to hear, it's, yeah, good things, but you also want to hear the bad things. You're going to want to hear the times, that, the things that you need to change in your life, Right? And that's what we see about Joseph. Right now, he's given a good interpretation. You know, this is kind of similar to someone, you know, you know just living a, a righteous life in general, just living a righteous life, and, and you're preaching against sin, you're preaching what is righteous, what you ought to be doing, and it encourages you when you know you're on track. You know, when we're preaching about soul winning, you're out there soul winning, you're seeing, you know, the, 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 the work of your hands, and, and you know that Lord is being pleased, you're being encouraged by those words. You know, you start to feel good when you, when you can see that your life lines up to the Word of God. But you also have to be ready to receive it when your life doesn't line up to the Word of God, okay? And let's keep reading here in Genesis chapter 40, verse 16. Genesis chapter 40, verse 16. Actually, before we read that, let me just read a very... Uh, popular passage to you in 2 Timothy 3.16. It says, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. So who does the, uh, sorry, yeah, inspiration of God, and is profitable, 
So it's profitable. Now, it's going to talk about two positive things and two negative things. It's profitable for doctrine, teaching. That's things that we can learn and grow by. That's a positive. And then it says for reproof. That's actually a negative. That's when you're being corrected, right? Or, or correction. Uh, there it is. Or correction. That's another negative thing in a, way, in a sense. And then it says for instruction in righteousness. Another positive thing. Okay, so we have a positive, positive, a negative, a negative, okay? The Word of God is given for us so we can profit, so we can grow, even if it, you know, ruffles our feathers a little bit, okay? We need to hear it. And look at verse number 16, verse number 16. So when the chief baker saw that the interpretation was good, so he says, man, he got a great interpretation. He's now thinking, I'm going to get a good interpretation as well. Things are going to go well with me. The interpretation is going to be good. He says here, he said unto Joseph, I also, was in, sorry, I also was in my dream, and behold, I have three white baskets on my head. And in the uppermost basket, there was all manner of baked meats for Pharaoh, and the birds did eat them out of the basket upon my head. So what do you think it's sounding like now? You know, he wants to serve Pharaoh. He's got those three baskets of bread, but constantly he's fighting off these birds from eating the bread in his baskets. That kind of sounds negative. That kind of sounds bad, right? I don't think this is going to be a good interpretation, right? But here's the thing. Does Joseph back away from giving a bad interpretation? You know? No, he's going to tell the truth. Now, look, if, if, if this, you know, if this uh, baker had gone to Joyce Meyer, okay, you know, Joyce Meyer would have said, you know, Pharaoh is not mad at you. <laughs> Pharaoh's not mad at you, you know, or, or Joel Osteen, live your best life now. You've only got three days, you know, <laughs> live your best life now. No, no, Joseph is not that kind of preacher. Okay, he's not that kind of preacher. Look at verse 18. And Pharaoh, uh, sorry, and Joseph answered and said, this is the interpretation thereof. The three baskets are three days. Yet within three days shall Pharaoh lift up thy head from off thee and shall hang thee on a tree. And the birds shall eat thy flesh from off thee. That's pretty graphic. So he says, look, in three days you're dead. Pharaoh's going to hang you. And your body's just going to be left to be eaten by the vultures, you know, whatever, the, the birds of prey, whatever it is in Egypt that they have there. So it's, it's bad news, okay? But what do we learn from Joseph? Whether it's bad news, whether it's good news, he's going to preach the truth. He takes God word, God's word. It doesn't matter if it's going to upset somebody. He's there to tell the truth. And that's what the preacher is for, okay? The preacher is to tell the truth. It doesn't matter if you feel that people are going to be offended or upset, or whatever. If it's the truth, it's the truth, right? If your life doesn't line up with the Word of God, you know, and the preacher preaches it and makes you feel uncomfortable, you've got to accept it, okay? Accept it and learn from it. It's profitable for reproof, for correction. It's profitable. God wants you to profit, okay? The reason you get convicted in your heart, the reason you get upset when you hear things like that is because God wants you to improve. God wants you to do, you know, like we said this morning, He wants you to do the things that you've heard and he wants you to bless you by the doing of his work, even if it's something you don't want to hear. And I'm sure this man didn't want to hear it. He wanted to come to church and hear the good news. All right? No, but sometimes the bad news needs to be preached as well. Okay? And um, verse number 20. Verse number 20. Actually, before I read that, 2 Timothy 4, 3. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers, having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. That's what Joyce Meyer does, the fables, right? The, 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 these preachers, these t uh, TV evangelists, fables, okay? They want you to feel good, but it's going to lead you to hell, all right? There's no point of, of Joseph making this guy feel good when he's going to die and his, his flesh is going to be eaten by birds, all right? Joseph was ready to tell him the truth. Okay, and uh, this is important because, again, I, I, I get sometimes people in church ask me about this situation. And, you know, the temptation in my flesh is to say, well, it's all right. Don't worry about it, you know. But is that the truth? No. Okay. And, uh, you know, I've been challenged on this a few times, you know. And it's like, well, why don't you, you know, make it easier for that person or why don't you, you know, just, you know, make them feel better? Look, I, I, I try to be as nice as I can. I try to be as friendly as I can with the brethren, right? Like Joseph was, he cared for those that were under. He cared for the butler, right? He cared for the baker, right? 
But at the end of the day, he's got to say the truth. This is how God sees it. This is how your life is interpreted in the light of, of God's word. And you're going to die. And that's the news that he's going to receive. You know, when we go and knock doors, what do we tell them? If you don't believe in Christ, you're going to hell. Okay, that's the truth. We're not doing it to get them all angry at us and just to spark controversy. We want them to understand the truth of God's word. And let me say, it's not always, it doesn't feel good as a preacher necessarily, does it? To tell them they're on their way to hell. You don't really want to do it. Like, in of yourself, you don't want to say that to them, right? But you're persuaded by God's word. You know the truth. You know they're headed to hell. And you need to wake them up and, and show them the truth, no matter how uncomfortable it is. Okay? And so, you know, as soul winners, not just the preacher behind the pulpit, but as soul winners, you will experience this. And you will be tempted sometimes to say, oh, don't worry, you're right with God. No. Okay? No, you've got to express the truth. Okay? And that's the kind of person Joseph was. Verse number 20, Genesis 40, verse 20. And it came to pass the third day, um, which was Pharaoh's birthday. And he made a feast unto all his servants. And he lifted up the head of the chief butler and of the chief baker among his servants. And he restored the chief butler unto his butlership again. And he gave the cup into Pharaoh's hand, but he hanged the chief baker as Joseph had interpreted to them. So you can see these dreams came to pass. You know, Joseph taught the truth, and these things came to pass. Now, let's not read verse 23 just yet. We're going to put this together with the verses that we skipped. So if you can go back to verse number 14, please. Verse number 14. And uh, so we're picking up the story once again when Joseph preaches uh, the good news, the good news to the, to the butler. And he says here in verse number 14, he says, after he's interpreted this dream, after he's made the butler feel better about himself and he's relieved him from those sorrows and those concerns, he says in verse number 14, but think on me when it shall be well with thee and show kindness, I pray thee unto me and make mention of me unto Pharaoh and bring me out of this house. What he's saying is bring me out of this prison. Look, when it comes to pass, you know, remember me. That, you know, God is using me. God has given me this ability to interpret these dreams. Let Pharaoh know about it, okay? Just remember me. Remember the good that I've done to you, right? It's not asking for too much. Verse number 15. For indeed, I was stolen away of the, out of the land of the Hebrews. And here also have I done nothing that they should put me into the dungeon. So I said, look, you know, just saying, look, I don't deserve what I'm suffering. You know, I don't deserve being in this prison. I don't deserve being locked up. So please think about me. You know, you've got influence. You're one of the chief guys there in Pharaoh's, you know, court, house, whatever it is. You know, uh, please think about me. Mention my name to Pharaoh so maybe he could make use of me. You know, he's asking for something that I think this guy should have been able to do. Okay? But drop down to num verse number 23 now. Drop down to verse number 23. It says here, Yet did not the chief butler remember Joseph, but forget him. So the chief butler had his dreams interpreted, felt better, and he forgot all about Joseph. Okay? Now, what's the lesson there for, for preachers, for leaders? You know? Or if you're not a leader, but you do well to other people, you do good to other people, you know, not everybody's going to thank you. That's the lesson. All right? That shouldn't stop you from doing good, though. Okay, you serve one another, you do good, you lift other people up, right? And it's going to happen that they're not going to thank you. I'm sure you can think right now of situations that you've done things for people, maybe even people in the church, hey, maybe even, even for me. Maybe you've done something nice for me and you didn't get the thank you. You know, you didn't get appreciated. You know, it was forgotten, the things that you did. And what happens, brethren, what happens when, when, when the people forget? You can get discouraged, you can get downcast. You can think, well, this person hates me. Why doesn't he like me? But maybe just forgot, right? You can think many things. And, and the worst thing to think about is this. Well, if people have used me, they've used me in the past, they've used me today, I'm done. I'm done with friendships. I'm done with service. I'm not going to do it anymore. I've been burnt too many times. Wrong. That's the wrong attitude, okay? The right attitude is to continue serving, continue lowering yourself, just doing what's right, just doing good to one another, just continue doing it. Once again, you're going to reap what you sow. If you stop sowing, you're going to stop reaping, okay? Continue doing what is right. And we see, look, Joseph was a great man, okay? And he's been let down again and again and again. And he does something great for this butler. Uh, yeah, butler. And he's been forgotten. Now, if you guys can take your Bibles and uh, turn to... Um, 
Keep your finger there, but turn to Luke chapter 6, please. Luke chapter 6. Luke chapter 6. And this is what's going to keep you serving one another. This is what's going to keep you motivated and not let down by other people. Colossians 3.22. You go to Luke 6. Colossians 3.22. It says, Servants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers, but in singleness of heart, fearing God. You say, you know, well, I, I pleased my brother. I did well to him. Well, do it fearing God. Put that as your priority. Because when they're unthankful, you're going to continue doing it with the fear of God, the singleness of heart. You're, you've got a single purpose in you. Verse 23, and whatsoever ye do, do it heartedly as to the Lord and not unto men. That's what you do. That's how you serve one another. You do it as unto the Lord, right? Now, if, if I say to my kids, you know, can you, can you fill up my cup? You know, sometimes I get half a cup back, right? Do it as unto the Lord. How much would you give Jesus? That's what you do, right? That's the I'm not having to go my kids once again, right? <laughs> I feel bad. I always mention my kids. I'll start mentioning other people's now. That would be worse, right? <laughs> I won't do that. Um, but hey, that's what we do, right? Whatsoever you do, do it heartedly. Do it with all your heart, the Bible says, as to the Lord and not unto men knowing that of the Lord you shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Christ. That's what keeps you going. That's what keeps you serving. I don't care if I'm not being thanked. I'm serving Christ, and the guarantee is he's going to give me the reward of the inheritance because we serve the Lord Christ. What a great thing as a Christian. Nothing we do, nothing good we do will go to waste. You know, if we don't get rewarded here, if we don't get thanked here, God's going to reward us in heaven for all eternity. It's never a waste to serve God. It's never a waste to serve the brethren. It's never a waste to do good. The Bible says to do good to your enemies. And those enemies aren't going to probably return that back to you, but you're even required to do good unto them. The Lord will see it. Do it as unto the Lord. Now look at Luke 6, verse 35. Luke 6, 35. Sorry, I skipped ahead. I mentioned the enemies. The enemies are mentioned here by Christ. Luke 6, 35. But love ye your enemies, and do good, and lend, look at this, hoping for nothing again. That's hard, right? I'm going to do good, hoping for nothing. Right? <laughs> hoping for nothing. You know, normally you do good expecting the thank you, expecting the appreciation. Nothing wrong with getting appreciation. But what, it's saying, what Jesus is saying here, do it just and hope you don't get anything. All right, why? Why? And your reward shall be great, and ye shall be the children of the highest, for he is kind unto the unthankful and to the evil. Man, your, your reward shall be great. You know what? Next time you do something good for someone and they don't thank you, rejoice, right? Rejoice. Your reward shall be great. That's how you continue serving, okay? Don't give up, brethren. Don't, don't, don't be weary in well-doing. You know, continue serving. Continue lowering yourself. Continue being Christ-like, even as unto your enemies. Okay? And uh, if you can go back to Genesis 40. Actually, Genesis 41. Let's go to Genesis 41. I'm almost done now. Genesis 41, verse 9. And uh, so we're fast-forwarding a little bit here in time. And just verse 9 is the only one we're going to be looking at in this chapter. Because finally, the, the butler remembers Joseph later on, right? It says here in verse number 9. Then spake the chief butler unto Pharaoh, saying, I do remember my faults this day. So the butler finally realizes, right? And what does it say? Oh, my faults. I did wrong, is what he says. I did wrong. The last thing I want to take out of this lesson, brethren, is, you know, like I said, I'm sure there are times you've done good to people and they've been unthankful, okay? But you know what? Guaranteed, guaranteed, there have been times people have done good to you, all right? And you forgot to be thankful, you forgot to appreciate them. I'm sure, all right, because we forget, all right? People, I'm sure people have done good things to you and you just totally forgot to say thank you. Maybe in your heart you're thankful, but you just forgot to express that to them. You know then what you do in that case when, you, when it comes back to your remembrance? Just like the butler, right? <laughs> just like the butler said, saying, I do remember my faults this day. And you go and thank them. Oh, I was a year ago. Go and thank them anyway if it was a year ago. You know, and I've got to remember this because there's a lot of people serving in this church. There's a lot of people serving 
in the church down in, in Sydney. And sometimes I get to church down in Sydney and they're running things on their own. And I, I you know, I just I start to start song leading and start preaching. And then I go home. And then I'm like, man, you know what? These guys are doing it without a pastor. These guys are faithful. They go into church. They're soul winning. You know, they're, they're, you know people are, are, are doing, th- people doing things here. And I often just forget. And then every, every now and again, I just, I just try to, all right, this Tuesday when I get there, I'm just going to thank everybody for I know what they do, right? Because <laughs> I don't want to forget. Like, you forget, right? You forget. You go through the motions and you forget the service that everybody is doing. So I haven't forgotten your services this last year. I've got you guys a little gift. I'll, I'll share that with you. I already shared that with you, but the, the calendar, okay? To make sure you pick one of those up. But, you know, let's make sure we show appreciation. If you have forgotten, well, the butler forgot as well. It happens. Okay, but when you remember what the good that people have done unto you, you know, go back and thank them. Go back and show them appreciation. So that's what I want to leave you guys with. You know, it, it's just serve one another. Just humble yourself. Just lower yourself. Joseph, you can see how much care he had for the people under his authority. You know, and secondly, make sure that whatever you're doing in life, you take God's word and shine the light on it. Good or bad, it doesn't matter. Shine the light of God's word onto your life and make the necessary changes. You know, be someone that's searching for the truth, no matter how offended you get at it. You know, and finally, you know, if you're not thanked, just keep serving the Lord. Keep serving the church. Keep serving the brethren. All right, let's pray.